Colleagues, students, it's lovely to see you here tonight. Um, David Kershaw, you have failed in your duty of care and I owe to your students. This legal and statutory duty requires the university to protect the physical, mental and emotional well-being. Very true, sit there. LSE has a large Muslim population as well as a Jewish anti-science population. We are appalled by the In the largest event, Let, let, it, let, it, let it speak, let it speak. It's racist, Islamophobic, and genocidal rhetoric. Many staff, students, and alumni have raised concern about this event and its relevance in an institution which is supposedly interested in serious academic discussion. Hate speech is not academic freedom. Racism is not academic freedom. To David Kershaw, you're already aware of Benny Morris' comment and his views. What you would have been aware of the protests at LSE in 2011, and aware that Cambridge Israeli society disinvited Morris on the grounds that he is, quote, racist. You seem more interested in provoking a controversy and reaction than being committed to your duty of care or academic rigor. Kershaw, you have failed your students and the LSE community. Hit speech off campus and racism. <laughs> Um, so, as I was saying, my name is David Kirshaw, I'm the Dean of the LSE Law School. I, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I've had emails from many of you over the past few days, over the past week. Um, I can only say I'm sorry that I've not replied to every single one of them, and there's been a lot of them. Um, so, I'm very, very aware that uh, inviting uh, Professor Morris has generated a controversy in the law school, and across the LSE as a whole. And so I wanted to speak to that controversy and I wanted to speak to the comments made by the student who just left. Um, I had to steal six or seven minutes from Professor Morris's time, uh, but I think it will be useful for us all to do this. So bear with me for a second and I'll uh, uh, try and get to the main event as soon as we can. Immediately after the terrible events of the 7th of October, there was an outpouring of grief, emotion, anger, and speech from all sides of this awful conflict. Students and alums paid very close attention to all this speech, especially to the statements made by academics and students online, or in print, or at protests. Several of the pro-Palestinian statements made by colleagues and students generated allegations that these statements were not within the law, or at least that it could be argued compellingly that they were not within the law. For some members of our community, in their view, these statements were not only unlawful, they also, we were told, made them feel unsafe and unable to speak. Others argued that some of these statements supported genocide. Many called for the LSE to investigate and discipline the colleagues who made these statements. We ex experienced similar responses and pressure from legal pressure groups and from other bodies. The response of the law school and the LSE was unified and in my view unequivocally correct. Whilst we will do our utmost to ensure that no one in our community feels excluded or unable to speak, we do not monitor investigate or discipline speech. 
We further explained to the people who complained about his speech that LSE never takes a view on any political issue or conflict, that our role, our mission, is to convene inquiry, debate, and criticism. And we explained that central to that mission was the freedom of speech and academic freedom of all students and colleagues. We pointed out that to investigate and discipline speech where the criminal justice system had taken no action would cast a long, uh, cast a long and dangerous shadow over this mission. The response to that explanation that we gave was generally very positive, understanding, and I would say accepting. But, said many of the respondents, that's fine. But surely that means that you truly have to be a place that convenes all sides of controversial debates. Rightly, in my view, they said, it can't be that you are neutral on paper, but not neutral on fact. In fact. Now, I've always been a very strong advocate of academic freedom and, and freedom of speech, but this experience was formative for me. It made me realize more clearly than I'd realized before that ensuring that we actually do convene all sides of the debate on controversial issues is central to protecting academic freedom and freedom of speech for us all. It is central because it empowers us to resist external and political pressures that can profoundly interfere with our academic freedom and the mission of our university. This experience made me realize that over the long run, the failure of the university to deliver open debate, balance, and viewpoint diversity is an existential, existential danger to the university. And it is particularly existential for a university that focuses only on the social sciences. Now this insight led me to talk to colleagues who are holding events on the conflict in the Middle East, to talk to them about ensuring diversity of opinion in those events. Now, some colleagues were, were resistant to, to including that diversity of opinion. They argued that others were welcome to convene events with other viewpoints, but that did not mean that academics who were holding events had to include all viewpoints in their events. Now, I think this is a position that is wholly defensible from the perspective of academic freedom. The problem, from my perspective, however, was that the events that were being held at LSE did not, as far as I could see, provide a sufficient range of views. Accordingly, in the law school, we have built a superb and balanced program of events on the conflict, with views from both sides of this conflict. And we will continue to do that. <coughs> But not only is open debate and diversity of viewpoint existential to the university and existential to LSE, it is also vital for the education of any social scientist and any legal social scientist. It is vital for you and for me. It is vital for us all. We can't hide from and silence arguments we find wrong, objectionable, or even abhorrent. We need to listen to them, engage with them, and then explain and justify why they are wrong. If you believe you are right, if you believe that the ideas, the language, the imagery, and the concept used by others are evidently wrong, then explain why they are wrong. And ask questions that reveal why they are wrong. If someone in my view is mistaken, then isn't it my responsibility as a social scientist to explain why they are wrong? Isn't it my responsibility to convince them of the error of my ways? If we are confident of our position, that we need to engage with those who we think are wrong. We should not try to silence them. Why, if we believe they are wrong, would we leave them with their views unchallenged? Why would we leave them with the impression that we doubt our own ability to win the argument? On this idea, I am with Norman Finkelstein, with whom Professor Morris has just two days ago been debating on the Lex Friedman podcast in New York, which I will believe will be released in a few weeks. As you know, Professor Finkelstein is a passionate critic of Israel. Finkelstein, Professor Finkelstein observes, I, and I'm quoting from him here, I do believe the truth comes out in the conflict of opinions, and then the viewers can listen, and when they are doubtful, they can check. And that's the way I think truth is discovered. <coughs> So, fellow colleagues and students, let us, following Norman Finkelstein, tonight have a conflict of opinions. Let us listen, 
debate, disagree, and attempt to convince each other. Now, in search of that conversation, we have lots of time for questions. And I will be liberal in giving students and colleagues the time uh, to make fulsome questions, to provide some context to those questions, so that you can indeed challenge Professor Morris on the views that he will articulate tonight. Now, turning to the main event, Professor Morris. I I think two responses that if I may. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, for your, thank you for your point. I think two responses. First of all, uh, my conception of neutrality in a university is to give people who have different views and different opinions and different perspectives the, the opportunity to articulate those different opinions and perspectives. So, so you, and I'm sorry I don't know your name, you can ask them questions, you can tell them that you don't think uh, that they're right or that they're, or you agree in part with them and why they are wrong. You can do that, you can articulate that in the same way that you've just critiqued me for my conception of neutrality. I think that's a fantastic thing. I think it's where we should be as a university, in a room, talking with each other, disagreeing with you in precisely the way you've done with me. Now, I want us to talk tonight about Professor Morris's ideas. So what we will do, Professor could I just finish my... The person you have invited has openly espoused ethnic cleansing and genocide. Let him speak. Let him see what he has to say. Let him speak. I will let you know what he has said. Let, 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 Can we just, everyone, everyone, everyone just be calm, we'll get through this if we have an exchange for ideas. Now, if I may, I'll let you speak, actually, I'll let you speak, but if I could just finish to make my second point. The second point is this, right, that what we don't want to do for the rest of the evening is have a conversation merely about the boundaries of speech. We've invited Professor Morris to speak. Now, what I will do after today's event is completed, and I've been speaking, we've had exchanges with the student union on this, is we will arrange an opportunity to have precisely the conversation that you want to have. But let me make your point, and then let me introduce Professor Morris. Let me introduce <laughs> Professor Morris to the <laughs> There are circumstances in history that justify ethnic cleansing. Yeah! Quote, even the great American democracy would not have been created without the annihilation of the Indians. There are cases in which the overall final good justifies harsh and cruel acts that are committed in the course of history. Shame. Shame! Quote, the Arab world as it is today is barbarian. The phenomenon of the mass Muslim penetration into the West and the settlement there is creating a dangerous internal threat. Of Palestinian society, <coughs> Professor Morris has said, and I quote, something like a cage has to be built for them. There is a wild animal there that has to be locked up in one way or another. Did, Shame! Professor, Shame! did Professor Morris ever retract his statements? Did he ever denounce his positions? No. He repeatedly reaffirmed them including in 2015 and in 2023 during the onslaught on Gaza. In fact, he supports the genocide of war on Gaza, opposes a ceasefire, and dismisses ceasefire protests from Hamas demonstrations. I cannot in good conscience pretend these are legitimate topics for academic debate. If someone had come to speak at our campus using the same language against Jewish people or black people or any group of individuals, on whatever basis, 
whether race, ethnicity, belief, he would have rejected them in the equal, uncompromising terms. So, thank you. I now, I now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the ICJ is investigating precisely this kind of speech as instigating okay. genocide. So it's a <laughs> So, so thank you, thank you. Uh, I would only say that maybe that would have been much uh, more helpful if you would articulate that as a question. This is, at, I refuse at the to the end debate of the event. This is really subtle position. Okay, good. I refuse to debate thank whether Palestinians are human or not. I refuse to debate whether they're humans or equal work. Thank you. <laughs> So um, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Morris to talk to us tonight. The topic of his talk is Rethinking 1948 and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. Professor Morris was born in Israel in 1948, the son of a diplomat and a journalist. He studied at the University of Jerusalem and the University of Cambridge, where he got his PhD. He is both an academic and a journalist. He worked at the Jerusalem Post for 12 years and then became a professor of Middle Eastern Studies at Ben Gurion University in 1997, from where he retired in 2017. Dr. Morris served in the IDF between 1967 and 1969, being wounded in 1969 during the Israeli-Egypt War of Attrition. In 1988, he was jailed for several weeks for refusing to serve in the IDF in the West Bank. He is a prolific writer that has published in most major English newspapers. Uh, remarkably, he has published 13 books during his career. His most recent book is entitled Sidney Riley, Riley, Master Spy, published with Yale University Press last year, 2023. Now, as has been made very clear already in our conversation tonight, as many of you are aware, Professor Morris's writings and positions have generated much controversy over the years. I don't know whether Dr. Morris would agree with me, but most positions in the debates about Israel and Palestine have at some point been subject to criticism by Dr. Morris, and equally in response, have generated a fair degree of resistance and fury from those subject to his critique. Perhaps the most recent example was his signing of a letter entitled The Elephant in the Room. That letter which he signed with other Israeli academics Referring to the West Bank, observes, and I quote, there cannot be democracy for Jews in Israel as long as Palestinians live under a regime of apartheid. For Dr. Morris in the West Bank, this is an apartheid based on nationality, not on race. Professor Morris, without further ado, I'm delighted to offer you the floor. I think we will talk from over there. Uh, on your talk, Rethinking 1948 and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, after which we will have lots of time for conversation to explore the conflict of opinions that Professor Finkelstein talked about. The conflict of opinions that Professor Finkelstein himself was negotiating with Professor Morris two days ago in New York. Let us have our own conflict of opinions, our own discussion. Let Dr. Morris talk and then let's have a conversation. Dr. Morris, the floor is yours. Not really, no. Somebody's already said that. They've already quoted me on that. You don't have to repeat. You don't have to repeat what everybody says. Keep going. No, don't keep going. 
if you want to, I, I assume, I assume that you want me not to talk. That's the whole idea. Is that correct? Do you want me not to talk? You can hear her any day you want. She's here. You can hear her. You, one second. One second. Do you want me to talk or not? I gather it's a minority here which doesn't want me to talk. Those were the kafirs. Bye. Okay, I'm going to talk about 1948. Um, I'll give you mainly facts. Occasionally, I'll offer an opinion or interpretation, which then uh, I will signal. This is an interpretation, not a fact. Otherwise, I'm going to talk facts. <coughs> the 1948 war was the culmination of 50 or so years of conflict between the incoming Zionist settlers in Palestine and the in inhabitants of Palestine, the Arab inhabitants, uh, who gradually achieved political consciousness and gradually began to resist the incursion or the influx of uh, Zionist settlers. <coughs> The War of 48 was triggered by the United Nations Partition Resolution of the 29th of November 1947. That resolution proposed, this is the international community talking, proposing a solution to the conflict between Jews and Arabs in Palestine on lines of partition, on the basis of partitioning the country into two states. The Arabs rejected the partition resolution, the Jews accepted it, and the Arabs the following day opened hostilities, began to kill Jews in Palestine, which was the beginning of the war. <coughs> the UN resolution was actually based on the principle laid down by a British Commission of Inquiry from 1937, the Peel Commission, which had proposed again the partition, or that was the first time this was put on the international agenda as a solution to the Palestine problem. They proposed partition between Jews and Arabs, they proposed 70% of the country for Arab sovereignty, 17% of the country for Jewish sovereignty, 1937, the Peel Commission. The Arabs, the leadership of the Palestine Arab National Movement, uh, led by a man called Husseini, rejected partition, rejected the Peel Commission recommendations, along with the rest of the Arab world. And this repeated itself in 1947. <coughs> The Arab uh, uh, assault uh, following the rejection of the UN partition resolution um, was divided into two parts. This is sometimes forgotten by people who talk about the 48 war. That war had two parts, two very different parts. One was a civil war between the Palestinian Arab uh, population and the Palestinian Jewish population. Uh, as I said, a law, war launched by the Arabs in defiance of the international community's proposals. And that civil war lasted from November 47 until May 1948. By May 1948, the Palestinian, Palestinian society, the Palestinian militias, which had initiated the war, were defeated by the Zionist or uh, to be Israeli troops. And the Arab armies invaded Palestine, the armies of the neighboring states invaded pa <coughs> Sorry, Palestine on the 15th of May, 1948, the day after Israel declared statehood. Thank you. Declared statehood. Israel was declared on the 14th of May. The armies of uh, Syria, Egypt, Iraq, and Jordan invaded the country on the 15th of May. That invasion was countered by the uh, Israeli um, national militia, the Haganah, eventually called the IDF. And by January 1948, um, the Israeli side had beaten back the invading Arab armies, um, and armistice agreements were <coughs> reached between Israel and its neighbors. There's a controversy or question among historians. The contro there's a controversy about the nature of the 48 war. Uh, traditionally, historians have said that the war was a political territorial war between two national groups, the Palestinian Arabs, uh, the Jewish community in Palestine, the Arab states, and the state of Israel. <coughs> um, 
And that has been the, the dominant explanation or description of that war. I would add to it that it was also a religious cultural war um, um, between Arabs, Muslim Arabs, both Palestinian and uh, from the neighboring states who regarded the Zionist, the Zionist presence, who regarded the Zionist who regarded the Zionist presence as an infidel, an infidel invasion of the country. They resented Jews, they resented Jews living in the country and establishing sovereignty in any part of the country. Most people want to hear me, not you. She should be ejected. She should be ejected. In any normal university, she would be ejected. We're not talking about Gaza at the moment. We're talking about 48. Let me finish. Later, ask a question. Later, ask a question. Later, ask a question. Later, you should ask a question about that. By, by. As I said, the, the war was a territorial political war, but it was also, especially from the Arab side, viewed also as a religious cultural war against an infidel invader. Um, um, that's worth remembering because the element of religion has become very important in this conflict over the past 70 years since 1948. The war aims of the two sides. Um, the Zionist war aims are much clearer than the Arab ones because the Zionists, unlike the Arab states or the Palestinians, have opened their archives so we more or less know what Zionist leaders, Israeli leaders were thinking and aiming for in the, the two stages of the war. Uh, the Arab side is much more obscure or black, if you like, because <coughs> Arab archives are all closed to researchers, both Arabs and uh, non-Arabs. <coughs> the Zionist war aims in the civil war, half of the war, were A, to survive the onslaught of the Arab Palestinian militias, and B, and this begins more or less from April 1948, was to expand the territory of the Jewish state to be beyond the borders of what the United Nations Partition Resolution of 1947 had proposed, to expand the territory. And in fact, the war ended with the Zionist side gaining 2,000 square miles above and beyond the 6,000 square miles which the United Nations had allocated for Jewish sovereignty in its partition resolution. Um, and this is from April onwards, this idea of accruing land um, um, gains traction, if you like, among the Israeli or the Zionist leaders uh, and military leaders. <coughs> um, the second the third war aim that he said survival was the first aim to counter the militia's assault on the Jewish community and the Zionist enterprise and to eventually establish a state which, as I said, occurred by 19, May 1948. The second aim, adding territory to the Jewish state. And the third aim, and this one is controversial among historians, many Zionist historians reject this, was to reduce the number of Arabs who would remain in the Jewish state, whatever its boundaries, which is sometimes called transfer or expulsion. That is to expel those Arabs, or many of those Arabs, who had assaulted the uh, Jewish state or the Zionist enterprise and eventually the Jewish state, um, uh, contrary to the will of the international community. Those are the three Zionist war aims in the civil war half of the war. These war aims, I think, were continued in the battle against the invading Arab armies. Uh, again, survival, surviving the pan-Arab onslaught, expanding the territory of the Jewish state, 
they believed to make it safer, but also to add territory so there would be more territory for Jews in which to settle. Jews who would be coming from abroad, immigrants uh, to settle in the country. And as I said, to reduce the number of Arabs who are considered potentially disloyal if they remained. Can I ask you to ask He's not asking a question. If it is able, it will also no, commit he's genocide. Not asking a question. One has to deal with the serial killer. Don't you like to hear anything? It's not so important think? to discover why he Don't became you like it. To hear anything What's important is to imprison to think? or to execute him. Don't you like Explain. to hear any contrary? Who is the serial killer in this portrayal? The barbarians who want to take our lives. Be shown out. No way. The people, the Palestinian societies to sins that carry out terrorist attacks. And in some way, the Palestinian society itself as well. At the moment, that society is in the state of being a serial killer. He's, he's taking up it is very idea. sick. I have to warn you, you are it should be treated the way we treat individuals who are serial killers. We should execute or imprison them. There's a clash between civilizations out here. I think the West today resembles the Roman Empire of the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries. The barbarians are attacking it, and they might also destroy it. So the Muslims are the barbarians then. I think the values I mentioned earlier are the values of barbarians. The Arab world as it is today is barbarian. And your views, these new barbarians are truly threatening the Rome of our time? Yes. The West is stronger, but it's clear whether it knows how to repulse the wave of hatred. The phenomenon of the mass Muslim penetration in the West and their settlement there is creating a dangerous internal threat. A similar process took place in Rome. They let the barbarians in and they toppled the empire from within. The possibility of anni annihilation exists. Many more is your... Contravention of the academic code. I will have to ask you to stop. The man that's speaking today. Okay. I, will, I have to warn you. I have to warn you that you are contravening the academic code. And I will have to ask you to stop. I have to warn you for a third time a small, a small that you are contravening. Do you know, do you know what? Do you know? Code. Do you know what civilized means? Do, and, and I will have to ask you to leave. Do you know what civilized means? Do you know what civilized means? 
Civilized means to listen also to the other side. Do you understand that? Do you know that? Do you know that? No, I'm not promoting violence. Um, um, I, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's time to remind you of the academic code, which we all have to follow. Okay, and that academic code is about uh, enabling conversation here at LSE. Um, I think we have been incredibly open to you making your statements. The statements have been uh, uh, covering uh, the same ground. You can ask Benny direct questions about what he has said once he has spoken, but the academic code requires you not to prevent participants from, ex from, from being heard, to prevent them from speaking. That is part of our code as a university of academics and students at the LSE. So I would implore you to let Professor Morris continue, and then I will create space for the conversation. I gave the gentleman who spoke and left five minutes ago the microphone. Okay, I gave him that so everyone could hear in the hope that he would ask a question to which Benny would respond. It is not consistent with our academic code to shout somebody down, to silence them. Okay, let's have a conversation. How can it be the case that Professor Finkelstein, the leading critic of Israel, is willing to sit down and have a conversation with Professor Moritz? to disagree, to argue, to tell him why it's wrong. How can it be the case that we can have a conversation on a podcast, but we can't have a conversation at LSE? I've spoken about the um, war aims of the Zionist Israeli side in the two parts of the 48th conflict. Let me turn to the Arab war aims in the war. The Palestinian war aims and the Arab war aims are unclear, mainly as I say because there's no access to documentation, if things were documented properly, there's no access to the documentation in the Arab archives because all Arab states are dictatorships and do not allow access to their archives and the Palestinians weren't a state, they didn't actually produce archives about 48. Sorry? Do, did they cover 1948? Would you know? Would you know whether they covered the 48 war? I'm talking about something else now. Did they cover the 48 war? We're talking about the 48 war. Yes, they did. Israel, yes, Israel did and returned the archives to the PLO. This is true. Yes, but this doesn't relate to what I'm talking about. The PLO produced, the PLO didn't exist then. The Palestinians produced no archives about the 48 war in the 48 war. And as I said, the Arab states may have produced archives, but they are not open, accessible to any a researchers, Israeli, a Arab, or foreigners. So we have a problem. So we have a problem. So we have a problem knowing exactly what the Arab war aims were, and we have a number of different parties: Palestinians, a, and then we have Egyptians, Syrians, Jordanians, and Iraqis. And all these archives are closed. What we do know from public statements, um, uh, statements afterwards, memoirs, and so on but also from the way the Arab armies moved, the way the Arabs behaved in the 48 war, we have some understanding of what their war aims were. The Palestinian Arabs probably wanted to abort the emergence of a Jewish state as uh, proposed by the United Nations in the partition resolution. This was the aim of their war making during the civil war. They failed in it and then the Arab states invaded. The Arab states the Israelis believed at the time intended to destroy the emergent Jewish state. It's not clear whether this really was the Arab war aim or of the various different Arab states as they sent their armies into Palestine. <clears throat> we do know that the Jordanians were very half-hearted in their invasion, in the, in the desire to destroy the Jewish state. Probably I'd go further and say they really had no intention when their armies crossed 
the Jordan River on the 15th of May, they had no intention of destroying the Jewish state. What they wanted to do was occupy the West Bank, the main area allocated for Palestinian statehood. The Jordanians invaded and uh, occupied that territory, uh, prevented the emergence of Palestinian statehood, and occupied it until 1967, the Six Day War, when Israel occupied the West Bank. The Egyptians, the Syrians, and the Iraqis were probably driven by a desire to eat as much, of they, as much as they could of the Jewish state to be, in other words, to occupy and cut off chunks, if you like, of the area allocated for Jewish statehood from the Jewish state. Whether they intended to completely destroy the Jewish state, we don't know, though this was what Israel or the Zionist leaders at the time believed was the Arab war aim. We also know that the Arab leaders were very reluctant, certainly King Farouk of Egypt, they were very reluctant to invade Palestine on the 15th of May. Um, they only decided, the Egyptian parliament and government only decided uh, on invasion, in fact, on the 11th of May, four days before the invasion, and against the, the, the pleas argument of the defense minister of Egypt, who said, we're not prepared for war, we won't win this war if we invade. But the Farouk and the Egyptian government, and I think this is true about the Syrian and the Iraqi governments as well, were driven by fear of the street, fear of their own populace, whom they had told the Zionists were evil, the Zionists intend to destroy whatever is around, um, 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 therefore we must prevent the Jewish state from emerging. Having inculcated the Arab masses, in Baghdad, in Damascus, in Cairo, that this was what the Jews meant and intended, eh, the kings could not step away from eh, invasion on the 15th of May, and therefore they invaded. In other words, they invaded partly because of fear of their own people, what the people might do to them if they failed to invade. We know that subsequently, then and subsequently, in 48 and subsequently, the Egyptian state looked to the Negev Desert, the part, southern part of Palestine, which had mostly been allocated for Jewish statehood in the partition resolution, to an area they wanted to occupy in the annex to Egypt. So this was also part of the reason for the Egyptians going to war. The Syrians probably wanted to invade in order at least to get hold of the Sea of Galilee and the territory around the Sea of Galilee. It's possible that the Iraqis invaded, and we know where they invaded the country, where they crossed the border and invaded the country. They probably wanted to occupy as much as they could of the pipeline, the oil pipeline, which brought oil from Kirkuk through, <laughs> through Jordan um, to um, the Haifa oil refinery, and they wanted to occupy as much as they could, or take over as much as they could of that pipeline, perhaps even as far as Haifa itself. This may have been the thinking of the Iraqis. Certainly they crossed the border where the pipeline crosses the Jordan-Israel border into Palestine. Um, A question which has arisen um, about the war um, among scholars is the balance of forces between the sides in the war. In other words, who was stronger? Who was David and who was Goliath? If you looked at the map of the Middle East, the Arab world stretched from Morocco to the Persian Gulf. It had tens of millions of population. The Jewish population in Palestine in 1948 was 650,000. 650,000. The Arab population of Palestine at the time was 1.3 million, twice the size of the Jewish population. And the Arab world, of course, had tens of millions of people. So in terms of demography, in terms of, um, in terms of geography, in terms of economic power, potential, uh, perhaps, uh, political and military power, the Arab world was, of course, the giant and the Jewish community in Palestine. 650,000 strong was a David. <laughs> but this didn't really re reflect the true balance of forces. And as we know from the outcome of the war, the Jews were stronger than the Palestinian Arabs and the Arab states. And how come this was so? <laughs> 
the Jews, knowing or believing that the Arabs would attack them, prepared for war. The Arabs failed to prepare for war. The Palestinian Arabs and the Arab states, they didn't prepare. The Jews were organized. The Jews had higher motivation than the Arabs in the fight. Uh, invading troops from Iraq or from the Nile Valley of Egypt were actually fighting in a foreign country. They'd come hundreds of miles to fight Jews in a land which wasn't theirs. <laughs> they weren't defending their homeland, they weren't defending their own people. Betty Morris is not only dehumanizing Palestinians, but I'm not talking about Palestinians. He called the Israeli Arabs a time bomb, claiming that. You're boring. You are actually quite boring. You're actually quite boring. I'd rather be a racist than a boar. If you like. disturbing the meeting in contravention of the academic code. I give you your first warning. You are disturbing the meeting in contravention of the academic code. That is your second warning. You are contravening the academic code. This is your third warning. I will have to ask you to leave the room. I will have to ask you to leave the room. I will have to ask you to leave the room. You are in violation. You are in danger your Palestinians. Can you leave the room? I have to ask you to leave the room. Thank you. Can I ask you please to leave the room? Can I ask you please to leave the room? Can I ask you please to leave the room? Okay, guys. Okay, so we've got a few options coming our way here, right? One is, you know, you finally sort of, you know, uh, ruin the evening and we can't have a conversation. No one can ask a question. I'm gonna let a, cup, I'm gonna let a couple of people ask a question. A short question, a question that doesn't involve shouting, Cameron, okay? That is a question. And then we will take the question and then we will stop the interruption of this meeting, this conversation. Now I realize that many of you have planned to keep interrupting. I realize that you feel obliged to do so, but your colleagues have made the point and we can have a conversation. So come on guys, let's have a conversation. I repeat what I said before. If Norman Finkelstein can have a conversation with Benny Morris, like ask him questions, disagree, why can't you? Okay, so Cameron, you're gonna ask a question and then we will let Professor Morris continue. You're gonna ask a question, right? I'm not gonna repeat some of the things that have been said by people already today. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard some of the hateful things that Benny Morris has said, I want to ask Benny Morris if he will denounce his previous statements which have incru included vitriolic hatred towards Arabs, Muslims, uh, justifications of genocide, if he will denounce them today and affirm the fundamental equality and rights of all people.
then you're very first on my list when we have questions. Ben. I've never supported genocide. I uh, denounce genocide. Uh, I believe people should have equal rights. Um, there's no question there. Morris has answered Cameron's question. Now. He answered with a lie. Last in February, you went to the media and he said that Israel, the IDF, should finish for their time in Qatar. Can I ask you to be brutal, I can't hear what you're saying. Take off the mask. Take off the mask. I can't hear you. I can't understand what you're saying. Take off the mask. Take off the mask. I can't hear what you're saying. Thank you. Can I ask you to leave the room? Can I ask you to leave the room? Can I ask you to leave the room? Can I can I ask you to leave the room? Can I, can I finish? I'm pretty close to the end of the speech, and then it'll be open to questions of all, all sorts, whatever you like. I was talking about the balance of forces. I said that the Arabs had various disadvantages, even though they had enormous geopolitical, uh, economic, uh, demographic advantages. But these were all basically neutralized or overcome by the Israeli side um, due to a number of factors, one of which was that the Holocaust had ended three years before, and the Jews in Palestine, Israel, believed that they were threatened by a second Holocaust three years after the first one had just ended. So the Jews in Palestine had tremendous motivation to fight, and also they were guarding, protecting their families and the homes um, uh, which were just behind the front lines, in fact, because the country is, of course, as you know, very, very small. So motivation was a major factor in the Israeli victory over the Palestinians and then over the invading Arab armies. In addition, the Jews, enjoyed, the Jews of Palestine enjoyed the economic support of Jews from abroad, mainly American Jewry, which basically financed the Israeli um, economy and war making in the course of the 48 war. The Arab states were much poorer, certainly the frontline states, and the Arab states, which did have some money, not like today, but some money, Saudi Arabia, um, which had oil and so on, weren't particularly generous towards the Arab states who were doing the actual fighting. So the Arab states lacked money with which to purchase munitions uh, and so on. Um, the Jews had more experience than the Arab, Arab armies who attacked them, including the Palestinians. Many of the Jews had fought in World War II Many of Palestine's Jews, 28,000 in fact, had volunteered for the British Army in the course of World War II to fight the Nazis. The Arabs, by and large, supported Germany in the Second World War, and very few of them volunteered to fight on um, uh, the, the Allied side, and therefore gained, very few of them gained any military experience in World War II. And this was telling especially in the air and naval arms, intelligence, the more uh, expert um, elements in an army. So the Jews had an advantage in these things as well. <coughs> One last point I wanted to talk about and then open the thing to questions. The war actually, created, generated three uh, refugee problems. We hear about the Palestinian Arab refugee problem of 48. 700,000 Arabs were uprooted from their homes, most of them moving to other parts of Palestine, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, a minority moving to Syria, uh, uh, Lebanon, and Transjordan. <laughs> and that Palestinian refugee problem still exists because the Palestinian refugees were not properly resettled anywhere, and down the generations continued to uh, cling to their uh, uh, status as refugees, and the world uh, continued to give them status as refugees, and that problem today continues to exist. Six million of them didn't be saved. Let me finish what I'm saying. 
Uh, may, may I finish what I'm saying? You're breach, you're may breaching I the academic code. Can I please ask you to leave? Ta take off the mask. The I can't hear what you're saying. Take off the mask. Take off the mask. You are breaching the academic code. Can I please? It's not a right. You are breaching the academic code. Can I please ask you to leave the conversation? It's not a right. Free speech Please isn't the right. Please leave the conversation. Free speech you are in breach right. of the academic code. Can I please ask you to leave the meeting? Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We. Okay, my last point. There were three refugee problems created by the 48 war. <laughs> three refugee problems were created by the re the 48 war. One was the Palestinian refugee problem, which continues to exist. Can I please, you're in breach of the academic code. Can I please ask you to leave the room? You are in breach of the academic code. Can I please ask you to leave the room? You are in breach of the academic code. Can I please ask you to leave the room? You're going to cause me emotional distress. You are causing me emotional distress. Colleagues. By the nonsense you're talking. Can I? But, Jesus Christ. Can I ask the student, can I ask the student who is sitting in the way of security to please stand up and let security escort you the sound students like a out of the product room. of emotional distress. You do sound like that. Can I please ask you to leave the room? Thank you. Can I ask all three of you please to leave the room? I just want to finish my last point. Three refugee problems were caused by the 48 war. One which we, we still exists, we know the Palestinian Arab refugee problem. The second refugee problem was that 70,000 Jews were uprooted from their homes in Palestine in the course of that war as a result of a, a Palestinian and pan-Arab aggression. Those 70,000 Jews were eventually reabsorbed in the Israeli states, most of them returning to their original uh, uh, villages and towns. And therefore, the Israeli uh, refugee problem uh, in 1948 was solved by 1949. You may think, of course, the number 70,000 is very small, but it's actually 10% of the Jewish population of Palestine at the time. Say America had a refugee problem with 10% of its population being uprooted. We're talking about 35 million Americans being uprooted from their homes. So you would understand it was a serious problem, the Jewish refugee problem in the 48 war. But as I say, it was solved uh, by the Israeli state um, and uh, vanished. The third refugee problem was that of the, Arab com the Jewish communities in the Arab states, numbering about 700,000 Jews, all of whom, as a result of the war, were uprooted from their homes. Something, some of it was expulsion, a very small part. Some of it was social and governmental pressure, which was most of them. And many of them also uh, were listening to what the um, radio and uh, leaders in Israel were saying, please come from Morocco, from Iraq, and come and strengthen the Jewish state. So in other words, it was a push and pull element in the creation of the Jewish refugee problem uh, from the Arab states. But over the years, 48, 50, 64, something like 700 Jews, 700,000 Jews were uprooted from the Arab world, uh, most of them arriving poor, destitute uh, in Israel, becoming citizens, absorbed as well as possible, uh, possibly not as well as possible, but eventually they became Israeli citizens and uh, uh, no Jewish refugee problem remains from the 1948 war. Uh, unlike the Arab refugees, of course, they didn't want to return to their uh, native lands, Arab states, in which, in fact, some of them had lived for thousands of years, way before Arabs had actually arrived in Baghdad. But anyhow, uh, they didn't want to go back, unlike the Palestinian refugees, who did want to return to their homes. Um, that's all I wanted to say about the war. Please, uh, questions. Benny, why don't you come and sit down here? Do you want to take I'm okay here. Okay, good. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Benny. So, um, um, 
So colleagues, because of all the disturbances, we have only half an hour of, of time. Um, so um, if you could raise your hands, please. Now, as I said to you at the beginning today, I'm happy to give you time uh, to set out your question and to contextualize your question, but I want it to be a question, okay? I want it to be a question, and I don't want it to be a speech. I think we have had enough speeches tonight, and we've heard those speeches multiple times. So, uh, uh, is, is this the mic you're using? Ah, I better give it to you. Um, so I've got the student in uh, uh, the maroon. She's there with her hand up in the middle. There you go. Um, just up, up to, yeah, just raise your hand nice and high. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hello. So throughout this lecture, you have continually referred to the land as Palestine. And many Palestinians have gener like generations upon generations dating back there. So going back to 1948, without knowing what the future would hold, what incentives would Palestinians have had to have accepted the 1948 UN resolution or whatever the one that they rejected? Why would they have done that? And if you were back then, not knowing what was going to go on in the future, and you were a Palestinian, would you have accepted it? Okay, that's a fair question. Perhaps had I been a Palestinian in 1948, I wouldn't have accepted the UN resolution of November 47. Um, but uh, the Palestinians at the time regarded themselves, and do incidentally today, as part of the larger Arab nation. Sometimes when it suits their purposes, they are Palestinian Arabs. When it suits their purposes, they are just part of the Arab Ummah, the Arab nation, or the, also the nation of Islam. Um, um, in 1948, there were several Arab states, five, seven, whatever the number was. Um, today, there's 23 of them. Um, the Jews didn't have a state, and after the Holocaust, were in need of a state, so they felt. Um, perhaps fairness would have said to Arabs, even in Palestine, uh, maybe the Jews should also be allowed a state like we have lots of states, maybe they should just have one small piece of land. Now they regarded, the Jews regarded that piece of land as theirs. In fact, many Palestinians, certainly in the 19th century, said this is the Jews' land. So said the, uh, Khalidi, the, the um, mayor of Jerusalem at the time, in the letter to her. So we know that this is the Jews' land in 1899. But what can we do? There's lots of Arabs living here now. So we can't now have an enormous influx of Jews coming in who may dispossess us in the end. That was his argument. But they understood that this land in some way belonged to the Jews. The Jews did think over the 2,000 years after they had been exiled one way or another from Palestine that they wanted to return there. So the Jews had a case as well, and this is in fact what the international community under the Peel Commission, under the United Nations, understood that both sides had a claim to the land. Um, and in a sense, the Zionist movement accepted this when they said yes to partition, a Jewish state, an Arab state in Palestine. So I would say, I would say this, I could understand Palestinians in 40, 47, 48 who rejected partition and wanted all of Palestine, as they say, from the river to the sea for themselves alone. But I think I would have also understood that the Jews have a case as well and abided by, obeyed, if you like, the international um, uh, resolution to divide the land between the two peoples. Now, that would be my answer. Thank you, Benny. So I've got this student here. Um, in, in white. I find it interesting that you say that you understood that you would understand a Palestinian in 1948. I'm wondering now, looking to the future, if you consider the situation that Palestinians find themselves in today in Gaza, where the violence we see is unprecedented, children eating grass, women having to use tent scraps as hygienic product, uh, products, not even, you know, to mention the death and wounded people in Gaza. How do you think a solution is possible in Palestine, in Israel? How do you think people from both sides can come to the table and speak? I mean, you see the statements, they're so polarizing. If you say, I believe in equality, I believe in, in these two people deserving a land on equal footing, how can we make that happen? If you can understand the position of Palestinians in 48, what do you think it's gonna be like today to achieve peace, to negotiate peace? Okay, I got the question. I, I'm a pessimist. I don't think that they can actually reach peace today. Um, I think 120 years of conflict 
terrorism, counter-terrorism, bombings, uh, bus bombings, and so on, um, have made both peoples move towards rejectionism. In other words, not accepting the other side and its legitimacy or its arguments uh, and claims. Um, so I don't, see, um, I don't see peace in the offing. I can understand the international community desiring a two-state solution, going back to the Peel Commission and the UN um, uh, General Assembly proposal, um, which seemed to give a mod modicum of justice to both peoples. But the realities on the ground are such that I don't see that happening. I don't see it happening. So what do we do? What? I don't know what we do. What about I have no idea. Because it won't work, because they've been fighting each other for 120 years, and hatreds are so deep at the moment uh, that I don't envision them living in stability and peace together under a one state. In a cafe, coffee shop in Paris or London, that may sound good. Live together, to, uh, it doesn't make sense in Palestine. Ask any Palestinian, ask any Israeli, they won't be able to work properly in a one state solution. They'll end in uh, rivers of blood and anarchy. That's all a one state solution, if it's tried, will achieve. So can I, can I, can I, can I? So it's, it's got no, there's no comparison to slavery in America. There was never slavery in Palestine. It's a different problem. It's a different problem. It, we're talking about two national groups fighting each other. That's not what you have in America. It's a different uh, so Benny, subject altogether. So, so Benny, if I, if I may just sort of in, interject, I think it's a, a wonderful question. And, um, and uh, you know, having read your work, I, I've seen you know, over time how you have become much more pessimistic uh, about the situation even though you've long been in favor of the two-state solution, you've become much more pessimistic and long extremely critical of the situation in the West Bank. So, but, but yet, the, the course of history as a historian is always that the things that we don't quite expect can happen, right? And solutions can be found where no one expects it. I mean, you know, we, you know, people of my age grew up with the troubles in, in Northern Ireland. And, uh, you know, 20 years, so, you know, 35 years ago, people would have said exactly the same thing. I'm troubled. There's too much hatred. We yeah, can't find a solution. So, so I, I, want, so I don't want to argue with you. I want to push no, you. No, Irishmen and Englishmen. I want to push you to be as positive as you can be. Okay. What would it look like? Irishmen and Englishmen speak the same language, pray to the same God, even if it's slightly different. Let me churches. push you. Let me push so you to be as the same positive problem. as you can be about finding a solution. Digging deep for that okay. positivity, what I would once, it look like? Okay, I, I understand the question. I once wrote in one of my books, I wrote that the only conceivable two-state solution would be between Israel, more or less, in the 1949 borders, and a Palestinian-Jordanian confederation, in other words, a sort of a vast Palestinian land, not just the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which are really two very, very small pieces of territory, Together with Jordan, perhaps there would be enough room for Palestinians in which to breathe, and therefore maybe that could serve as a basis for a two-state solution. A two-state solution between a West Bank, Gaza Strip, even East Jerusalem state on the one hand, and Israel in its 1949 borders will not work because the West Bank, Gaza state will inevitably be a springboard to attack the Jewish state after those, that two-state solution is reached, in my view. Student over here. The blue. Uh, thank you. Um, I was going to ask two questions on a slightly different note, but maybe I'll start with the first one being a bit related to this. I guess, so my question is, how could we, um, and before I pose the question, I want to obviously say that um, hopefully I don't phrase this in any um, offensive way. Is there a way where we could remove religion from the topic of conversation? Um, obviously without forgetting what has happened in history, wherever it may be, but is there a way we can remove religion from the conversation? Because today we talked a lot about the Jewish question, the Muslim question, but then also like a Christian like myself, we forget about that element and the Christians who were there living um, centuries ago and who still live there today, we kind of forget about this. So is there a way we could remove the religion from the question? And then I guess secondly, this comes to what you spoke. This is uh, on a very different note. Um, what you spoke earlier in your lecture about the military archives. I've read your book. I've read other Israeli and uh, Palestinian historians' books on who use the archives. And so my question is, um, even though the Israeli archives were made public, how come there is such a vast different interpretation of the events that has happened in 1948 
Um, and I guess even, even within what are labeled as Israeli new historians, the different interpretations from yourself and other historians such as Ilan Pape and Rashid Khalidi, one of the Palestinian ones who used the same uh, uh, military okay. archives. Answer I the hope second my question, question. Was, was clear. Um, I'd be happy to read No, no, I understand the question. Um, in relation to the second question, it's really quite simple. Some of us are good historians and some are not. But I'm, I'm, this is a joke, not, don't, don't quote me on that. Um, look, you can look at the same documents and interpret them in different ways, this is true. But usually the weight of the evidence in, in shows in looking at documents, that is a certain weight to it. So if you latch yourself onto one document which has no reverberation or echo in any other document, maybe it doesn't make sense. But if you go with the weight of the evidence, which I feel, I believe that I've done uh, usually, um, I think you end up with what is closer to the truth, the interpretation which is closer to the truth and the construction of the facts more closer to what actually happened than uh, otherwise. That, that's my belief about that. Um, but look, this is what historians are supposed to do. They're supposed to look at, look at the documents, see as many documents as they can from as many places as are uh, accessible and uh, present a construction of the past, describe what happened in the past, and interpret what happened, meaning interpret what people, were, what their motivations were, what they were hoping for, what their goals were, and what had induced them to do what they did. And that, that, that's all historians can do. I'm sorry to hear that uh, Papi and others have um, um, differ from me in their interpretations. But that, that's, that's historical. If everybody said the same thing, all historians said the same thing, the same interpretation, the same construction, there wouldn't be any fun in it. Um, religion. Re I believe that 90%, maybe more, of Arabs in Palestine, Muslim Arabs in Palestine, are believers. They believe in God. They believe that Allah exists. They believe his will is important in the way things happen. Um, um, in 1948, this certainly was true. Um, they are believers and they believe that what happens in the political realm in some way is expressive of God's will, Allah's will, um, or hope so. Um, and that they have to lend a hand to bringing about what they believe Allah wants. This wasn't true in 48 about the Jewish side. Less than 10% of the Jewish population in Palestine was religious. The whole Zionist experience, the whole enterprise was based on casting religion aside, the, the world of their fathers coming to Palestine, establishing a secular, democratic, most of them social democratic state. Um, so religion played a very minor role on the Jewish side in the 48 war. The religious parties, there were some there, there were some religious leaders, but they had no effect on what happened in the war, in the war making. They didn't control the defense ministry, the prime minister's office, the, the security services, the intelligence services. These were all held by socialist Zionists, social democratic Zionists. Um, religion didn't play on the Jewish side almost at all in the 48 war. It was very important on the Arab side. And you can see this from various texts. On the 1st of December 1947, two days after the UN passed the partition resolution, 1st of December 1947, the ulama, the Council of Theologians of Al-Azhar University, which is the most important determinant of a um, religion or the will of Allah, if you like, in the Sunni Arab world, the majority Arab world, they passed a call for jihad. They issued a call for jihad. 1st of December 47, which they reissued a few days before the pan-Arab invasion of the country in May 1948. And they reissued it again, a call for jihad, meaning all Muslims around the world must come together, mobilize, either with cash or with their legs, come and fight the Jews, the infidel, in Palestine. They did the same in December 48, by which time they had already lost the war. But Al-Azhar said, this is the Muslims, the worldwide Muslims' duties uh, to, to come. And this was more or less felt by most Muslim Arabs in the 48th war. So religion played a very important role. Today, unfortunately, religion plays a much ra larger role than it did in 48 among the, in the Jewish side as well, because the religious parties and the religious population, because of demography, they have lots of children, uh, now represent something like 30 or 40% of the Israeli Jewish public. 
Uh, and they have religious interests. They want the Temple Mount. I mean, uh, extremists among them want to build a temple there again, the third temple. Uh, they think religion plays a role in this, this thing, and they believe it should play a role. Uh, unfortunately, this has remained true on the Arab side, uh, as I say, representing what I believe is a majority among the Arab uh, uh, side also. Uh, um, Christians in Palestine at the, at the time in 48 represented 10% of the Arab population. 10% were Christian, 90% were Muslim. Today, the number of Christians is much less. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but towns like Bethlehem, which used to be Christian towns, are now Muslim towns. Bethlehem, yeah? Um, so religion plays a, po a part, and I think this, as you say or imply, it's terrible that it plays a part because religion stirs enormous passions. Um, that's how, in fact, people like Haj Amin al-Husseini mobilized Palestinians to attack Jews in 1929, 1936, 1947, 48. He called on religion saying the Jews want to destroy their, your holy sites. Come and, come and join the ba banner of Allah uh, to fight them. Uh, unfortunately, this is true today, and with the Hamas, which is a fundamentalist Muslim uh, organization, um, religion is, has become even more important because the Hamas, as you know, represents the will of most Palestinians, according to all opinion polls, both in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank. I think we should let somebody else answer. Okay. So I'll give, I'll give Fatou just a very quick comeback, if I may, just give you a very, very quick comeback, and then, and then I'll bring, bring in the student next to... Can everyone's hands up, please. Can I see them again? Okay, <laughs> a lot of hands. Okay, um, good. Um, so that student there needs to get a nice a balance of. Uh, okay, got you there in a second. Okay, good. Um, good. Over to you. Oh, so Fatou, I'm giving you a chance to come straight back. Sorry, apologies. Um, uh, yeah, quickly. So, in, and now kind of more related to my question then, how we, we've seen how religion has played a role different, uh, in different times. To on the Jewish side and on the Arab side, um, and it's come back, especially um, as you were explaining within the Zionist side now. How can we now remove that element? Is know. there a way to establish and reinterpret all the events? If you if you could kill God, it would help. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know. Gen gentleman there, and then woman over here, um, and then gentleman in the middle here. So okay, it's good. So. Uh, good evening. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I just very sort of quick question. Um, given that we are in the UK, I thought maybe you could just speak quickly about um, the role of Britain. Uh, so one interesting thing reading sort of the mythos of both sides is a sense of uh, both sides seem betrayed. Um, the both seem to suggest that uh, Britain was maybe supporting the opposite side or even fighting with the opposite side. Um, and then there's the role of of whether Britain should have done more um, to I, I don't know ensure peace basically in a longer term. Um, so I, I just have to sort of get your opinion on that. Thank you. I'm, I, I think I missed that. Um, what, what is the question? Say that Did again. The role of the UK in the 48 war ah. and specifically the, in the... Take, um, you speak into the microphone if you mind. Thank the you. The role of Britain in the 48 war and the, in the perceptions of... Okay. Both it's a good, a good subject, uh, the role of Britain. Firstly, when you look at Britain in the 48 war, you have to look at London, the government in London, but you also have to look at the British government, the mandate government in Palestine itself, and its armed forces in Palestine. Um, both sides misinterpreted in 48 and subsequently Britain's role in that war. Um, the Arabs believed that the British in 48 supported the Jews in the war, and the Jews believed that the Arabs supported um, um, the British supported the Arabs in the war. In other words, it was like a mirror. Uh, but both interpretations were wrong. London wanted to minimize the damage to its place in the Arab world by its behavior in the 48 war. Um, and so London projected a more pro-Arab stance in 48. They uh, abstained in the partition vote. In other words, didn't vote for Jewish statehood in 48. In 47, they uh, supplied Arab armies with arms and ammunition up to May 1948, which helped them in the battle, though they didn't supply enough arms or ammunition, apparently, to win the war. Um, on the other hand, the government in Palestine uh, was neutral. And this is something both Ben-Gurion didn't understand and the Arabs didn't understand. That the government in, in Israel, in Palestine, the British government, didn't want to fight either side. 
Uh, it wanted peace. It wanted to restore law and order. It couldn't actually achieve that without losing lots of British troops. So they didn't interfere much because they didn't want to lose their own troops as they were busy withdrawing. They were attacked by uh, Israeli uh, terrorists in the course of the war. Not only did the Irgun and the Stern Gang attack the British and kill British soldiers and officials before 48, but they did so even in the midst of the war, believing that the British were helping the Arabs. Uh, so the British were very, it became gradually more, uh, or the British troops on the ground became gradually more antagonistic towards the Zionist side. Um, but nonetheless, I think they uh, behaved quite honorably. That's my interpretation of what happened, looking at all the various things that happened in 48. They tried to steer a middle course, not to lose troops, to try and reestablish law and order in the country, which was impossible, uh, and not to side with either side. Um, and as you know, Britain came out poorly uh, politically from the war because both the Arabs and the Jews um, believed that they'd helped the other side. Thank you, Professor Morris. So I've got you and then I've got... <laughs> At the beginning, you noted you will state facts and will let us know when you are talking about your interpretations. Then you noted that the only military archives from the war available are from the Jewish state. I didn't say military, I said archives. You said the archives available are only from, are not taken from Arabic countries because all of the Arabic countries are dictatorships. So I have two questions. One, does that mean that the so-called facts you're talking here today are based on the accessible documents and evidence which you claim to not include the issue from the Arabic side and is therefore one-sided? And two, as, you, as I said, you called all the Arabic countries dictatorships. Is that one of your so-called facts that you're explaining to us here today? Uh, I, think, I think it's really pla <laughs> in plain sight that the Arab states are all dictatorships. Lebanon may be the only, Lebanon might be the, Lebanon might be the only, ex Lebanon might be the only exception, except it's a failed state and so chaotic that it's run by, it's, it's basically governed by a terrorist guerrilla organization, not by a government. But all the others are dictatorships. Nobody questions that. Assisi, Bashar uh, Bashar Assad, uh, they're all dictatorships. I, I'm sorry, I, I'd really like them all to be democracies, but they're not, and they never have been. Because democracy, unfortunately, hasn't taken root in Arab, society, Arab Muslim societies. It just hasn't worked in Arab societies. What can you do? What has taken root in Arab societies is civil wars, which you have in about six or seven Arab states at, the very, at this very moment. At this very moment, in Libya, in Syria, in uh, Yemen, you name them, the Sudan, they're all. Anyhow, I don't want to go into that, but back to the main question. thing. Uh, facts. Um, archives, I believe that historians should rely on archives to establish what happened in the past, to reconstruct the past. Um, the archives I'm talking about are not necessarily Israeli or solely Israeli archives. There are United Nations archives, Red Cross archives, which I've recently used in my forthcoming book, um, American, British, French archives, all these books, all these archives do exist. So they give you, they give you a little bit more, uh, something much wider than just understanding the Israeli side. I'm not saying it's, it's not problematic, but they had diplomats and consuls in the Arab states. They talked with Arab leaders. They reported on their talks with Arab leaders back to Whitehall. So we do have some, ins and there were intelligence services which also penetrated the Arab world and told them, told their uh, uh, superiors back in, in, in London or Washington or Paris what the Arab side was thinking and doing and aiming for. So it's not, the Arab side is not a complete blank. As I say, there is a, was, was a way of penetrating it for historians. There is a way of penetrating, but it's not enough. And with the, uh, hopefully the Arab states will one day open their archives, firstly become democracies, then open their archives, and we'll know more about the Arab side and the war. Thank you. It's the best I can do. Gentlemen here at the, at, at the front, can I just have a hands up again, please? Okay, and I'll take you at the back there after that. So, okay. Uh, uh, Professor Morris, if I could just challenge you on the role of religion. Um, there, it has been suggested that eighth law in the Oslo process was that there was insufficient uh, thoughts about the role of religion and that maybe if more 
if there had been greater thought given to the theological issues, and that if more people of faith, both with both Muslims and Christians and Jews, had been involved in the process, that the Oslo that the, the Oslo Accords would have been more durable. And you know, there are examples uh, of where seemingly people with very th different theological positions uh, have been engaged in negotiation. There was um, there was a there's a well-known rabbi from the settlements who was involved in, in discussions uh, with Islamists uh, in, in, and, and with some... I used to know him. Right. right. Uh, so, <laughs> so I just want to kind of push back gently on the suggestion here that this is all because of religion. Uh, and there are, there are theological solutions for some of the seeming problems between, between the faiths. I'm not sure the problem is the theological. I, I'm not sure that's the right word. It's the introduction or the, the projection of religious elements into a, poli a political problem. That, that's, that's what we're talking about. Now, you're right that when you come to talk about the future, for, for example, of the Temple Mount or Haram uh, al-Sharif, whatever you want to call it, um, and how it can be solved, and a, a theological arguments are important, but I'm not sure theological arguments are the problem in general. Um, um, but religion is important in, 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 in the conflict. Um, I don't know if I've answered you, but uh, you, I've you, tried you, a bit. Do you want to come back there to, to push back a little bit on that? Because I think this is a really important point, right? We're looking for space and solution. We're trying to encourage you to be more positive. I think the gentleman here has has a, 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 an idea of in the incorporation of, of, of different elements of Palestinian and Israeli society to reach a solution. So, gentlemen, feel free to push back a little bit. Uh, th thank you. So, one of the things that's great about LSC is it has a faith centre uh, which promotes religious literacy. Uh, and, and quite often, not just in the context of Israel and Palestine, but other, but all kinds of uh, situations, conflicts, and, and non conflicts for that matter. Uh, not that much attention is given to the issue of religion uh, and there's a kind of sometimes it feels like an overwhelming consensus that religion is best left at the door it's something that you know polite people don't discuss yeah uh, and um, and actually that's something that is worth challenging and, and perhaps there is a need to rethink uh, a lot of issues to try and try and find to try and find those um, the relevance of religion to it, whether or not it's solution-led or not, is a, is a, is a Okay, there, there are people, certainly on the Jewish side I know, who think that solving the religious, religious conflict um, uh, would help to solve the conflict uh, in general. The guy I'm talking about, uh, um, whom you referred to, yeah, right. what? F Fuhrman, 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 yeah. I remember him in reserve duty, he used to sit in the edge, we used to be in the same unit, and he used to sit out on the edge reading his Talmud or a uh, Bible um, while we played bridge or something. But that, that's what he used to do. But then he became uh, this um, religious go-getter and um, trying to meet um, uh, fundamentalist uh, Muslim leaders in the West Bank. And to, he thought that that's the way that perhaps they could break the impasse and reach also political uh, resolution. Um, I've never thought that that is the way to do it, but, um, but that's me. Oh, oh, absolutely. Uh, sure, sure. Can, we, can we let the, 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 the student in with the mask? No, I'm happy, speak, I'm happy for him to speak. Sorry? I'm happy for him to speak. Okay, if you want to defer, then... then, then I, I'm not so much, let's ask a question, Cameron, okay? So ask, ask a question that can respond to, 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 to Benny's answer before. And then we'll come, then we'll, then we'll come back to you. Since other people have been given the right of reply, I'd like to take mine. Um, I asked Benny Morris to explain and denounce his previous statements. He then said he claimed that he is uh, a believer in equality and the rights of all, having minutes before said that he'd rather be a racist than boring. That was a joke, Jesus Christ. I think given the <laughs> do you have current a sense of humor? Context, do you have a sense of humor? I'm asking a question. I do, I think it's quite And you know that it was a joke. Go ahead. Professor Morris, let him ask the question. Go ahead. Um, so I just, yeah, I would like him to clear up properly to explain previous remarks that he's made and how he squares that with his supposed belief in equality and rights, having claimed for Arabs to be put in cages and justified the genocide of Indians and various other okay. statements. 
the remark about the <laughs> genocide of the um, Indians in America was a misquote. It's not true. And I wrote that in Aritz against Ari Shavit's um, presentation of what I had said. Um, it wasn't obviously absorbed by lots of people, but that is something I reject completely. I never said that. Um, as to genocide, I've always opposed it on both sides. Um, I do believe, I re reiterate, I do believe that people should have equal rights. Um, I think Israel, in Israel, people do have equal rights, even though uh, Arabs uh, occasionally are treated as second-class citizens or discriminated against. Apartheid no, it's not an apartheid state. It's a part. There's apartheid. Yeah, no, no, there's no, no, in, no, no. In the West Bank, there's uh, in, in the West Bank, there's military law. In Israel, Israeli Arabs and Jews live under the same law exactly, with Arab judges and Jewish judges. I'm talking about the West Bank. There, there is some form of apartheid regime. There's a military government. It's based on nationalist problems, not race problems. But there is an apartheid regime, but not Israel itself. You have to separate the two. Maybe look at a map. Maybe look at internet or something and find out. About can we that. let Can we let Professor Morris answer Cameron's question, please? He, he, we he um, posed a question. Let him answer it. <coughs> I still believe theoretically, in a two-state solution. Theoretically, because I think that, as I said, would give a modicum of justice to both peoples. Um, but I don't think it's achievable. That's the problem. I don't think it's achievable because most Arabs in Palestine, as far as I can tell from opinion polls, uh, reject a two-state solution. They want all of Palestine from the river to the sea, as some supporters in England uh, often suggest. Uh, and more and more Jews don't want a two-state solution. I think if the Arabs the Palest Palestinian Arabs have come up with a Sadat, who went, Egyptian president, who went to the Knesset, said, we are willing to make peace. Give us the Sinai, we'll make peace with you. And Israel and Egypt made peace on that basis. Had the Palestinians had a Sadat of their own, a man with some courage, not a manipulator, liar, thief, uh, cheat, uh, everything else, like Arafat, had they had a real leader with some courage, perhaps they could have reached a two-state solution. Arabs in cages was is taken out of context. It's a, <laughs> no, no, it's wait. Can I can I finish? Can I finish? You asked something. The phrase Arabs in cages wasn't Arabs in cages. It was caged Arabs off of Israel in 2002, 2003. There was a second intifada in which Arabs were daily crossing the border from the West Bank into Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and planting bombs in Israeli buses and uh, cinema houses and restaurants killing dozens of Israeli civilians on purpose, almost on a daily basis. Uh, at the time, caging off the Arabs from the West, of the West Bank from coming into Israel made perfect sense to me. That was the context in which that was said. Israel eventually built a wall, which was, if you like, caging Arabs off from the West Bank into Israel. And that a wall or fence, in fact, it's mostly fence, not wall, was built. And very few suicide bombers have reached Israel since that wall was built for that purpose exactly. That's the context in which you ask that question. So are you proud of that wall? Can we, so so we, are, we are running out of time. And I'm not proud of any wall. I am not proud of any wall. You asked me a question. I'm not proud of any wall. That's the question you asked. I'm not proud of any wall. I've just answered you. Student, student, um, so, so student at the back there. Can, can we make sure this is a question, please, in context? We, we don't want a speech, I want a question. We're doing really great here. These are, we're having a good conversation. Let's have a question. Thank you for giving me the mic, David. So would, you, would you mind pulling your mask down because we I can't can hear you? I can, but I have a cough, actually, so I'm really sorry if you catch COVID. Me guys. too, incidentally. Um, but thank you for giving me the mic. I mean, I wouldn't speak without it. That wouldn't, that'd be too free. We'd be a bit afraid of that, wouldn't we? Um, you talk about academic freedom, but uh, protest is part of that vocal of freedom. I mean, I was gonna ask a question, but I actually don't care what you have to say because um, Martin Luther King comes to mind and what he said about the white liberal in his letters from Birmingham. Um, so actually, I don't think it is right to platform anyone. And I'm just trying to use up the last minutes because you were actually over the time that you were allotted. I hope the rest of the event goes awfully as it already has. Um, and 
Uh, free Palestine, free Palestine, thank guys. You. Thank you, thank you. Can I? Bye. So, so, so uh, the, the student is absolutely right about the fact that we are out of time. So uh, I'm going to steal Benny. You must be exhausted. Um, I'm okay. So, you so, ask if, so you if you have to take a couple more questions, yeah, sure. that'd no be problem. amazing. No um, I've got, I've got uh, this gentleman here. I'm sorry. I'm generally going for anyone who is under the age of 35. Um, if, if I think you're under, over the age of 35, I'm, I want to get the students involved, if that's okay. Um, and so I've got this, this gentleman here. Uh, and then I think the very final question will be uh, the woman over there, okay? Sorry, uh, this gentleman here uh, with the black T-shirt. So no, you need the mic so everyone can hear you. So, Benny, thank you for the talk. Thank you, David, for uh, chairing what's been an unfairly, I think, difficult talk to chair. Uh, my question is a bit forward-looking, I hope that's fine, rather than historical. Um, recently, Anthony Blinken uh, sort of insisted, I think his words were, on an irrevocable roadmap towards Palestinian statehood. Um, question is twofold. Do you think, first, that sets a bit of a dangerous precedent in terms of encouraging terrorist action to extract political concessions? Uh, and if that is the case, and indeed the short-term hopes for Palestinian statehood are dashed, uh, do you think that's going to be an obstacle to broader Israeli-Arab normalization of ties, for example, with Saudi Arabia or with Qatar? Well, that's a broad question. Um, look, the Americans want a roadmap, have proposed that they want, said they want a roadmap uh, for a two-state solution. I'm in some way all, all in favor of it, except I don't believe it's going to happen. The problem is that um, the Palestinians, I, I think both the Hamas, which says so openly, and the Fatah, in other words, the PLO or the Palestinian Authority, uh, have the same uh, approach to the problem. They want all of Palestine from the river to the sea, all of which negates the two-state idea. And on the Israeli side, uh, um, Netanyahu doesn't want a two-state solution, he said that. And I think much of the Israeli public, and perhaps even by now most of the Israeli public, also doesn't want a two-state solution because they don't believe that such a solution is tenable, that the Arabs will abide by it. If they do get a state of their own, they'll only use it as a springboard, like the Gaza Strip was, uh, to attack Israel. So I don't think a two-state solution is is going to happen. I just don't see it. It's, I, it's nice that the Americans and the, the European community support the idea of a two-state solution. As I said, I think it were it to come about, it would give some sort of justice to both peoples, but I don't believe it. Unfortunately, don't believe it's going to happen. But, but of course, thank you. And with thank that in mind... I'm oh, sorry. Um, Can I just quickly just have a follow-up on that? Just, so, so um, again, you know, trying to maintain I think some, some degree of positivity. So that is true when you, do, when you do opinion polls of Israeli citizens now, but that was also true when Israel did a, uh, did a peace uh, uh, deal with Egypt. And at the time, the opinion polls were completely against the peace deal. But once a peace deal was reached, and, and Israelis felt like the solution, the, the, peace, the peace deal could, could, was for keeps, the opinion polls completely changed. So I think we need to be careful when, okay. we reject, when we reject possible solutions just to focus on opinion polls. Do you think that's right? The Middle East has tended to, supply, to, to surprise people. In other words, what you expect or what you think, you think things are get, heading towards doesn't always uh, actually come about. Um, so the Middle East could surprise us, and um, you may be right, you're certainly right about 19... In, in 77, 79, that much of the Israeli public opposed the deal of giving uh, the Sinai, uh, all of the Sinai in exchange for peace with Egypt, and then um, basically uh, came round to Begin's opinion, to the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, that it's worth doing it, and uh, supported the peace deal. And the naysayers, incidentally, after the signature, said, well, the Egyptians are going to renege soon, and they, they will kill their leader, Sadat, and then the things will change completely. And for some strange reason, the Israeli-Egyptian peace has held for the last 50 years. I mean, who would have believed it? Even the Muslim Brotherhood, which came to power and ruled Egypt for about a year after uh, Mubarak's overthrow, even the Muslim Brotherhood stayed away from the peace deal and left it in place uh, with Israel. So um, it's possible, as you say, that things which are unexpected, don't make sense, will happen in the Middle East. Um, um, and I hope you're right. So do I. 
So, final part of the question, Cameron, and then final question over here, and then I think we have to end the event. Of course. I, I take your point that at this point, uh, everybody in Israel, including people on the left, have been sort of alienated from the idea in the short term. That's why I ask, what are the implications of this for broader relations with the Arab world? I don't know. This depends on the leaders of Saudi Arabia, and that's what we're talking about, uh, whether the Saudis can agree in the, state of, the, state, the current state of, of affairs to make a deal with Israel. I don't, it doesn't look likely, and they, I don't know if it's going to be likely in the future, because the Israeli-Palestinian thing is a long way from being sorted out. Hi, so I've been looking at state formation in Israel and Lebanon, and you mentioned this before, about how war can make the state and the state makes war. So I was just wondering in terms of Israel and each conflict, how much did war help and enable the formulation of the state because it had a very exceptional state formation and how different types of like nationhood and like tax revenue instruments can help this. Just in your opinion. Yeah. Um, the, the Israeli state was actually formed in the decades before 48. It was declared on the 15th of May. The state of Israel is established. But it was formed by the Jewish community in Palestine, the Zionist enterprise, had already put all the blocks in place for establishing a state. So the moment they converted from um, wards, if you like, of the British mandate, um, to statehood around the 14th of May, uh, there was a state in place. They had a, a militia which was uh, basically converted into an army by simple definition, redefinition, on the 1st of Jan uh, June 1948. The Haganah became the IDF. And uh, the different departments of the Jewish agency, which had been the governing body of the Jewish autonomy, if you like, or the Jewish uh, the Zionist enterprise in pa Mandate Palestine, its different departments, education, politics, etc., simply became the Israeli foreign ministry, the Israeli finance ministry, and so on. Um, so the state was formed, in effect, in the decades before, leading up to 48, not by the war itself. The war defined the borders of the new state. This, this is what was important. But there are places where, where, as you suggest, war itself has been a major element in state formation. I don't know, Bangladesh or somewhere, uh, perhaps. But um, um, in the case of Israel, it's a bit, it was a bit different, I would say. Wars have tended to define the borders or redefine the borders. 1948, 1967, 1973, 1982, all of these have redefined the borders, changed the borders of the state of Israel, but not state formation. Benny, Professor Morris. I'm fine. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time this evening to talk to us. I know the first part of this conversation this evening was difficult, but I think uh, we've had a, an, an excellent conversation the past 45 minutes. So colleagues, please join me in thanking Professor Morris. <laughs>